I was recently chatting to my parents and they began to tell me that someone broke into my uncle's neighbor's house with possible intentions to kill. But thankfully, they weren't in at the time. This case takes place in my home county of Yorkshire. In 2002, a man named William Brace was walking through Selby. Selby is just a small town out of York. William then spotted his ex-girlfriend, but next to her was his friend, a man named Mark Hobson. Feeling a little betrayed, William went over to confront Mark. As the two of them stood in front of each other, Mark lashed out and struck William in the stomach. William stepped backwards in a great deal of pain clenching his stomach. At first, William thought he had simply received a punch from Mark, but then he looked down at his hands to see them covered in blood. Mark had stabbed him in the stomach with a Stanley knife. Mark then walked forwards towards William and proceeded to stab him five more times in the stomach. And he did all of this during the middle of the day in front of passers-by in the small market town. William fell to the floor, bleeding profusely. And according to passers-by, Mark seemed to enjoy the sight of his old friend laying on the ground, bleeding to death. William had lost a substantial amount of blood and suffered a punctured lung, but thankfully he managed to survive. Mark would later confess to cause grievous bodily harm, but used the excuse of self-defense. And believe it or not, it worked. Mark didn't receive a custodial sentence as they didn't deem him a threat to society. He was only sentenced to 100 hours of community service and a two years probation. I think it's fair to say that Mark more than likely attempted to take the life of William on that day. And if only courts had recognized this at the time. Now, strangely enough, Mark didn't always start off this way. Let's rewind a couple of years. Mark married his high school sweetheart who was named Kay, and they tied the knot in 1993. And he also adopted her children too, and they would later have a daughter of their own. He worked honestly as a gardener, and his wife described him as being the perfect husband and father. That was until Mark began to drink heavily, after he became a bouncer at a local nightclub in Selby. At around this time, Mark began to act more and more erratically, and became more violent too. He began to have violent outbursts over trivial things. On one night, he went into his fridge to get a beer. In his drunken state, he actually had forgotten that he finished them all. But he saw Red and grabbed his stepdaughter by the throat, accusing her of stealing his alcohol. Mark and Kay ended their relationship in 2001, as he just became too volatile, to the point where even his own daughter wanted nothing to do with him if he continued to abuse alcohol in the manner that he was. His ex-wife would later say that nobody else was involved. He just didn't want the married life anymore. She then said he never drank when they first married, but now he was getting out of his face and he was acting like a zombie and that his life went completely off the rails. Mark then met the woman whose ex-boyfriend he would later stab. She was named Claire Sanderson, and they met through a mutual friend. The two quickly became close, and they both shared a problem with alcohol addiction. They were a rather bad influence on each other, and they spent a lot of time drinking. And quickly, the two became violent with one another. And they often did this in front of other people too. Mark came up with a rather disturbing name for his new girlfriend. 8-Ball, which was a chilling reference to the amount of bruises he gave her. Their toxic relationship began to create great concern. Many people close to Claire attempted to persuade her to leave him, but she refused, claiming that she loved him. When the couple was sober, people said they were good together, but once they drank, things became abusive. Despite Claire's damaging alcohol habit, she was still close with her twin sister, who was named Diane, and her parents too. But Mark had a little secret. Whilst he was working with a colleague one night, 
he began to confess. He said that he had felt that he had chosen the wrong twin, and that it was Diane that he wished he had a relationship with. On the 10th of July 2004, Mark and Claire went out drinking in a pub, and they left together at around half seven that evening. Both of them were rather intoxicated. At this time, Mark was 35 years old, and the couple were actually on a break at the time, as Claire was beginning to get fed up with the constant violent outbursts. A few people saw the couple on their way back to their house. This was the last time that Claire would ever be seen alive again. As just the day before, Mark had written down a list of items on a piece of paper. Large bin liners, fly repellent spray, air fresheners, and tie wraps. Essentially, the items he would need to assist him in his first killing. They entered the house, but once Claire had her back turned to Mark, he picked up a hammer and began to savagely beat Claire. He struck her in the head 17 times, and then he strangled her past the point where she would definitely have been dead. He then dragged her body upstairs to the bathroom and cleaned her body before wrapping her in bin liners and then wrapping her up in a carpet and hiding her behind the sofa. Over the next week, Mark kept Claire's decomposing body in the house and he would even talk to her from time to time, telling her that he had a plan that he had written down and that his next victim would be Claire's twin sister, Diane. His girlfriend's murder was planned, but he had rushed it too much. With Diane, he wanted to save her every moment. On the 17th of July, Mark made a call to Diane. He said that Claire had glandular fever and that she wanted her to come visit. Diane, of course, didn't suspect a thing. When she arrived, she would have seen the blood in the apartment. But before she could even react, Mark had already struck her on the head. Mark then began to inflict a disturbing amount of abuse, torture and humiliation upon Diane. She was hogtied. He used a lighter to burn her pubic hair. He then took a razor and began to slice open her skin all over her body. And just before he began to sexually assault her, he bit down on her nipple and ripped it off. And the nipple was never recovered or found. So it's thought that he chewed it up and swallowed it. He then began to stab her in the genitals. Once he felt satisfied with what he had done, he placed a plastic bag over her head. But it's unknown whether he did this to kill her, as she could have been killed by the multiple injuries she sustained. Mark began to worry that Diane's boyfriend Ian would start to wonder where she was. Diane had said that she would meet with Ian after she had seen her sister that night. But when she didn't show up, he became suspicious. Ian phoned Mark and inquired as to where his girlfriend was. He told him that the twin's father had passed away. This was of course a lie, to bide more time. Ian and Mark met in a pub for a quick drink, and then Mark invited him into the house. Ian then made a comment about a foul smell, completely unaware that his girlfriend's mutilated body were just in the other room. Mark just brushed it off, saying he had problems with the drains. Then, Ian looked down at the sofa and noticed a blood stain on the seat. Mark just laughed and explained it away as woman's problems. He then offered for Ian to stay the night, which he accepted. The next day, Ian woke up and went to pay his respects to the mother of the twins over their tragic loss. When he got quite the shock, he was greeted by their father, who was alive and well. Upon seeing the father of the twins, he explained the situation. Fearing the worst, they both went to Mark and Claire's house, and there they found the twins' decomposed bodies wrapped in bin bags, and Mark was nowhere to be seen and was now on the run. Mark had called his mum and told her a lie too. He said that the twins had had a car accident and that he needed a lift to the York hospital to visit them. 
she drove her son there with absolutely no idea of what he had just done, which gave him a head start on the run from the law. But now, he needed money to help him on his way. This is when he broke into my uncle's neighbor's house to get food and money. Thankfully, they were on holiday at the time and he stayed the night there before making this route. The police soon came to Mark's house to gather evidence and to take away the bodies of the twins. There, they found the shopping list which showed that Mark had planned these sickening crimes. But they also found a list of people who were believed to be targeted next. These included the twins' parents and Mark's ex-wife Kay. The next day, when Mark was making his way up this route, he noticed a large house. Inside were an elderly couple that was sat at home together, enjoying their retirement peacefully. The couple were in their 80s and their names were James and Joan Britton. James was a retired railroad surveyor that suffered from Parkinson's disease and Joan struggled to walk without assistance. Mark broke into their home in search of valuables and cash. But for some reason, Mark picked up the walking stick of James and beat him to death with it, striking him in the head multiple times and leaving him there lying in a pool of blood. He then found Joan, and he did the same to her too. But he also took a knife and stabbed her in the back, with such force that the blade went all the way through her body and broke off inside of her. Mark was now the most wanted man in Britain. The public and the police were fearful that he would strike again. My friend told me that he remembers helicopters flying over his house in search for him. But Mark had been laying low in a forest, and around eight days into his hiding, he became thirsty as he had no access to clean water. So he decided to take a risk that thankfully didn't pay off. He went into a petrol station to get a drink and some cigarettes, but Mark's face was literally all over the news, so the station worker recognized him immediately and he contacted the police. In a matter of minutes, the armed police had come to take the crazed quadruple killer away. They discovered him hiding in a ditch trying to evade them. Mark admitted to killing the twins Sarah and Diane, but said that he had no recollection of ever breaking into the elderly couple's home and savagely beating them to death. He used the excuse that he had been on a cocktail of cocaine, ecstasy, alcohol and cannabis for the past five weeks, but he did plead guilty to the four murders as there was substantial evidence against him killing the couple. He was sentenced to life in prison with absolutely no chance of being let back onto the streets. Mark made an appeal for a lower minimum sentence, saying that he was unfairly treated and that he should have been given a more lenient sentence because he admitted to all four murders at the earliest opportunity. The court thankfully denied his appeal. Mr. Sanderson, the father of the twins, made a statement. He said, I went over and grabbed hold of them. I knew that Claire was inside. I looked back to Diane. I just wanted to cuddle her. I didn't know what he had done to her. I thought he had raped her. He had taken away her dignity. She lay there with no clothes, covered in bruises. I knew she was dead. It's likely that Mark will die behind bars for what he did to those four innocent people. He is being held in Wakefield Prison in Yorkshire, where he has been since 2005. You can find him on the home office list of prisoners with whole life tariffs. Thank you for watching. If your friends or family watch this kind of content, then please share it with them as it helps the channel to grow. Also, don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already and click the notification bell so you never miss an upload. And I'll see you in the next video.